Hey everyone, so today I'll be talking about a you know, two-sided malicious security for private intersection sum. And this is joint work with my co-authors at Google and with Pei Han Yao, who's uh, uh, starting as a professor at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, so first I'm going to describe the problem and why we care about it. Uh, so our problem is a special case of secure multi-party computation. So as most of you already know, secure multi-party computation and this two-party computation. So we have two parties with inputs X and Y, and they want to compute functions F and G on uh, their joint inputs, such that neither party learns anything additional about the other's input. And so we're focused on this functionality, which we call private intersection sum with cardinality where it's basically a special case of secure multi-party computation, where the output that the parties want to learn is the size of the intersection of their databases, and also the sum of the associated values or values in the intersection. So here, the items in the intersection are the intersection between inputs X and Y, and one party holds some weights W or values W, W1 to Wn, and the party should also learn the sum of the wi for those xi or yi that were in common between the two parties. And why do we care about this uh, problem? Well, it turns out to have a great deal of uh, practical applications. So Google recently had a, not that recent, maybe a couple of years ago, had a blog post about uh, what they call private join and compute, which describes exactly this problem. And they talk about many interesting applications to it, including to, uh, uh, privately measuring aggregate ad conversions. And Facebook has recently shown also interest in this problem, and they've uh, also had a recent blog post talking about private journal compute and other ancillary protocols, and they've also talked about the usefulness of being able to compute sums over an intersection in a private way. So this is a problem which we know has a lot of interest in practice. Uh, and so just to recap some of the problem, uh, the characteristics of the problem of private journal compute or private intersection sum of cardinality. So uh, in the original work by Google, uh, they discussed mostly honest but curious security, uh, which means uh, participants are uh, assumed to follow the protocol steps honestly, uh, but try to learn as much as they can from the transcript. And uh, the protocol, the applications also assume that both parties receive the output of the protocol. And furthermore, the uh, main measures of efficiency are communication costs and monetary costs of running the protocol. And these, those papers claim, uh, are more important than in turn runtime. And a special piece is that revealing the size of the intersection is uh, OK or even desirable or useful for some of the applications. Uh, this is interesting because in many cases, like where you want to compute over the intersection, like being forced to review the size of the intersection is seen as an undesirable leakage. But in the case of some of the applications, we actually need this intersection size. So in this work, we're going to be focused on keeping all those other constraints that uh, come from the practical applications, like both sides receiving the output, focusing on uh, minimizing communication costs and monetary costs and being okay with removing the intersection size, but trying to beef up the security guarantee that we can provide by providing security against malicious or active adversaries who can arbitrarily deviate from the protocol in order to try to learn more than they're supposed to. Uh, so I'd like to start by first talking about some straightforward approaches that uh, you know, normally you should check when you're trying to go from a semi-honest secure protocol to uh, security against malicious adversaries. Uh, so I'll quickly go through some of these. So the first straightforward approach is to just add zero-knowledge proofs to each step of the semi-honest protocol to make it so that each party has to prove that they did their step correctly. And that's how you normally get malicious security. Uh, but to see why we run into difficulties, let's just quickly recap what happens in the semi-honest protocol. So you have these parties with their inputs, and what they're going to do is they're going to generate keys for uh, the polling helmet cipher over some group. Uh, let's say it's an elliptic curve group for now. And so the first party is going to take each of its inputs and then hash it into the curve for the cipher, and then encrypt it using its key share, K1. 
and send them all to the second party. And then the second party is going to apply a second layer of polycommon encryption and then shuffle these double encrypted values and send them back to the first party. Then the second party is going to single encrypt its uh, values y1 to yn, and then also send along its uh, associated values w1 to wn, encrypted using an additive homomorphic encryption scheme. And the first party is going to add it the encryption layer of k1 to the second party's inputs. And then now both parties' uh, parties' uh, inputs are in this double encrypted space, encrypted k1 and k2. And so the first party can just determine which of the items are in the intersection and thereby learn the intersection size. And then also add together the corresponding homomorphic encryptions to get an encryption of the intersection sum. And then send this back to the first part, the second party to get decrypted and we'll send it back. Let's help both parties to the cardinality and the sum. Uh, so now the first problem we get when trying to add proofs everywhere here is it's easy to prove that everything is exponentiated to the same exponent, but actually we also have to prove that the thing that's being exponentiated is a hash of something to the curve. And then proving this hash actually turns out to be very annoying and expensive. So that's one problem with following this first recipe. And the second thing is the first party uh, you know, does this thing of figuring out what things are in the intersection and sum the corresponding values together. But how is the first party supposed to prove to the second party that it summed the right things and not just whatever it felt like? Like this also turns out to be uh, quite an annoying thing to prove, uh, to create a proof for. And so this is the second difficulty that we get uh, when trying to follow this strategy. So this strategy has some difficulties. So the second strategy is to take an existing protocol that uh, gives malicious security for a private set intersection, and uh, but that only has one sided output, and then transform it into a protocol that has two sided output. And there's actually several excellent works that uh, give very efficient protocols for a private set intersection with one sided output uh, uh, with security against malicious adversaries. And the standard way for turning a one-sided output protocol into a two-sided output protocol is to have both parties commit to their inputs and then run the protocol first in one direction and then in, in, in the other direction. So one party being the output receiver and the other party being the output receiver. And then in each of these uh, executions, proving that the inputs used by the parties are the committed inputs. And this is a straightforward recipe and it works, but the problem is proving using any of those uh, existing protocols with proofs that you use the inputs that were committed to actually turns out to be not straightforward and adds a bunch of expense. So basically this also runs into this problem that it's not easy to compose these protocols with committed inputs. And the third option is to use uh, generic secure computation techniques. Uh, and there are actually great works that do this as well. So one prominent one is uh, uh, one that uses garbled circuits in order to do private set intersection uh, using the so-called sort compare shuffle technique. And this is great because this actually extends straightforwardly to uh, malicious security. It also enables a two-sided output for the protocol, and it also enables computing functions of associated data for things in the intersection. But the problem is that these generic techniques usually incur very high um, communication costs and because of that very high uh, monetary costs. Uh, and this is usually because in order to do these techniques, you have to bitwise encrypt each of your inputs and that causes a large communication blow. So our approach or our contribution is going to be to uh, give a new protocol that gives private side intersection with cardinality security against malicious adversaries, supports two-sided output, and has communication costs that's only modestly larger than the semi-honest protocol based on decisional Diffie Hellman. It's a private joining compute protocol, and monetary costs that's somewhat larger than the semi-honest protocol based on DDH. And here, monetary costs are going to measure using resource costs for cloud machines in, uh, from a public cloud provider. Okay, so now let's start getting into uh, what our exact construction is. 
So our idea is going to be kind of to follow the recipe for the private join and compute protocol. And uh, inside that, our first step is going to be to build a distributed OPR app. The distributed OPR app is where two parties have shares of keys K1 and K2, and one party has a bunch of inputs. And at the end of the distributed OPR protocol, both parties are going to learn the evaluation of a pseudo random function F, which has you know both keys K1 and K2 as its key, and uh, evaluated on each of the inputs. Uh, and the reason that both parties can learn the output is that, like, as long as uh, not both the part, like, uh, neither party has both the key shares, so the output is going to look super random to each of the parties. So our first idea is to build a distributed OPRF protocol, and of course, secure against malicious adversaries. And then we're going to extend this so that the party who provided the inputs is not going to learn the uh, outputs in the same order, but it's going to learn them in shuffled order with the order of shuffling chosen by the other party. And the point of this shuffling is so that the party is not going to be able to figure out exact later on, the party is not going to be able to figure out exactly which items are in the intersection, but rather it's only going to see how many items are in the intersection. This is similar to the strategy taken in the semi honest protocol. And in order to achieve the shuffling with malicious security, we're going to use a shuffle proof. And there's many of these uh, in the literature. We're going to use a specific one, which we'll talk about later. And so once we have the shuffle distributed OPRF, we're actually all set to get a protocol for just the PSI cardinality part of the problem, which is to find the intersection size. And the way we're going to do this is we're just going to have the SDOPRF evaluated first on one party's inputs and then evaluated on the second party's inputs. And then we have to do it with the key, the same keys. And since the SDOPRF uh, has a property that both parties receive the OPRF evaluations, uh, now both parties can just look at the transcripts from each of these two different uh, protocol executions and see how many of the OPR outputs were the same between the two. And that's how they can figure out what the intersection size is. And so this gives us cardinality. And then now if you want to extend to sum, so now one party has these associated values, what we're going to do is use a homomorphic encryption of the uh, associated values. And these are going to get sent along in the uh, shuffle DOPRF evaluation in the second part. And this homomorphic encryption is going to be a split key encryption so that uh, the key is shared between the two different parties, the decryption key. And we're going to kind of uh, provably shuffle and re-randomize the encryptions of these associated values with the same permutation that's used to shuffle the OPR evaluations of the Y values. And then in the output of this, so the output of this protocol will be the OPR values and also the associated uh, uh, Encryptions of the uh, uh, W values, but shuffled and re-randomized for the same shuffle. And then once you have this, both parties can again look at the transcript and see which of the uh, OPR values are in common across the two, and then add together the associated homomorphic encryption values to get an encryption of the intersection sum. Uh, and then once you have this encryption of the intersection sum, the parties can interactively and provably decrypt this value to get the actual intersection sum. And we note that this fact that uh, both parties can look at the transcripts and see exactly which OPR values are in common and then deterministically add together the homomorphic associated homomorphic encryption. This avoids that major headache we talked about, which is how is one party supposed to prove to the other party that this homomorphic encryption of the sum was created correctly. Like here, the point is that both parties can do this independently and deterministically create the ciphertext that has the homomorphic encryption of the intersection sum, so no additional proof is needed. Like both parties know what the ciphertext is supposed to be. Okay, so this is our recipe, and then now we can talk about what exactly is the OPRF we're going to use, and then we'll talk about exactly how we implemented each of the steps of the protocol. So the OPRF we're going to use is a variant of the so-called Doris Yampolsky PRF, which is um, also sometimes called Bone Boyan PRF. And the variant we're going to use is one that allows split keys. So uh, the normal PRF just has one key K, and the evaluation is g to the one over K plus X. But for us, we're going to have additive shares of the key, K1 and K2. 
And the security of this PRF can be based on the Q inverse CDH assumption in the group generated by G. Uh, and it also turns out there's interactive protocols to uh, compute this PRF, uh, it, not in the split key setting, but in the single key setting, but we're gonna do a variant of those. And those protocols uh, leverage the uh, Kamenis Shoot crypto system. So this command and crypto system is an additively homomorphic encryption scheme, and it ha it's, uh, supports proofs of uh, that you encrypted a value and proofs that you decrypted a value. Uh, and so now we can get into exactly how we're going to implement our distributed OPRF. So uh, let's just assume the first party has the inputs right now. And now so both parties are going to generate key shares for this distributed OPRF. And they're going to agree on a generated G. Uh, for a group capital G, uh, and let the order of that G be Q. Uh, this Q is different from the Q in the Q inverse DDH assumption, but here let's just think about Q as being the order of this group. Uh, and so the part, the second party, the non-input providing party, is going to send a shoot encryption of its key share K2. And the first party is going to use the homomorphism of the command shoot encryption to uh, send an encryption of K1 plus K2 plus XI for each of its inputs XI. But actually, this on its own is not secure. So actually, the first party is going to mask it using random masks AI and BIQ. So AI is going to mask the K1 plus K2 plus X. And BIQ, this thing is there because basically the message space of the command issue encryption scheme is different from the uh, exponent space of G. And so this BIQ is kind of simulating a mod Q operation within the plain text space of the commercial encryption. That's my step. And so the uh, party who receives the commercial encryption is now going to decrypt it and then invert it and exponentiate G to the one over AI, all this stuff, whatever it decrypted. And because the order of, uh, the, uh, of G is uh, Q, the BIQ part disappears. So you get one over AI K1 plus K2 XI. And then the uh, receiving party can just remove uh, the power AI by exponentiating into AI. But actually, we do a small optimization to uh, make this a little bit more efficient, which is that the first party is actually going to send along uh, G to the AI along with this command issue encryption. And the second party is going to use this G to the AI to exponentiate with the inverse. So instead of using G, it uses G to the AI. And then the AI is automatically going to cancel out. And so the result is actually going to be already F uh, evaluated, the, the distributed OPRF evaluated on XA. And so this is exactly our distributed OPRF protocol. And it's uh, like both parties get the output. Um, and uh, in addition, we have to have uh, ZK proofs for each thing. And it turns out that uh, Kometa Shoop encryption and all these other things, all these other operations are amenable to uh, different kinds of ZK proofs based on Sigma's protocol style proof. Uh, uh, the special piece that we need to know here is actually we need to do, uh, all our proofs need to have a range proof component to it um, because the orders of the groups that we care about are, are different sizes. So in order to prove that we, you know, if we wrapped around in one of in both the groups, then you could have a problem. So you need to do a range proof to show that you didn't wrap around in at least uh, one of the groups. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so this is our thing for uh, DOPR. But now, what if you want to do shuffle DOPR? But what we're going to do is instead of send, and instead of the second party sending back just the you know the OPRF evaluations, it's instead going to send back Elgam all encryptions of the OPRF evaluations, and then it's going to send a shuffle and decryption of the Elgam those Elgam all encryptions, and this is how we're going to implement our shuffling. So the changes are instead of sending the OPRF values, send Elgam all encryptions, and now we have to change our proof so that we have to prove instead of saying that we decrypted this, the second part, decrypt the value and exponentiate with the inverse. It's going to be decrypt, uh, invert, exponentiate, and re-encrypt it uh, So it's a slightly more complicated proof, but also very doable. And then also we add a second proof, which is going to be a shuffle and decrypt of these Elgamal values. And for this, we're going to use a proof from uh, Bayer and Growth from Europe of 2012. 
Uh, there's many different ones. We just use this one because uh, it seemed the most straightforward to implement. Uh, and now we have a protocol with those components. We have a protocol for malicious PSI cardinality. And now if we want to extend to PSI sum, we're going to do what we talked about before, which is that we're going to get this split key homomorphic encryption scheme. And specifically, we're going to use split key exponential LGMOL for our additive homomorphic encryption scheme. And it turns out if we use exponential LGMOL as a homomorphic encryption scheme, there's a problem that the uh, values need to be bounded into something that can be uh, decrypted by a discrete log. But that turns out to be OK for most of the applications that we care about. Uh, but if we use this uh, exponential LMO, uh, it turns out that this is very compatible with the shuffle proof that we use for the DOPRF section. And the shuffle and uh, re-randomization can be uh, added on to the shuffle and decrypt proof from, that we already had uh, with a small additional cost. And so that's exactly what we do. And as you mentioned before, both parties can now figure out what's the uh, encryption of the intersection sum, and then we do an interactive decryption uh, proofs. And this is also straightforward for uh, exponential of all. And so this is essentially our protocol. And there's a few uh, additional tricky parts here. Uh, uh, so one first tricky part is that, uh, unlike some of the previous works, we don't assume a trusted modulus uh, for uh, commitments and commit shoot encryption that uh, uh, that was assumed by some of the previous works. And so each party is going to independently generate its uh, moduli for uh, command issue encryption. And then they're going to have to prove to each other that these moduli are OK. And then a second big issue is that many of these proofs are crossing uh, different groups. And so a lot of uh, care needs to be taken. Like This is a massive place for pitfalls and uh, soundness errors with, uh, with different ZK proofs. And we have to care really carefully use the strong RCA assumption and QC's bridge commitments in order to make sure that everything works OK. And then another important piece is that we had to uh, design a custom uh, decrypt uh, invert and exponentiate proof. So decrypt can manage to invert and exponentiate and encrypt with LGMOL. And a standard sigma protocol doesn't work in this case. And uh, finally, it turns out the Q inverse DDH assumption, which uh, gives the security of the OPRF, uh, assumes a polynomial domain. So that would restrict the x and y values to be from a polynomial size domain. Uh, but we tur it turns out we can get around this by uh, if we commit the inputs uh, beforehand. If each party commits x and commits to y beforehand, uh, before choosing the keys for the OPRF, then it turns out that it can be an exponential domain as long as the number of, uh, as long as the input sizes are polynomial, you know, like the number of inputs is polynomial. Okay, and then furthermore, we have a whole bunch of batching techniques that you describe in the paper, and these batching techniques are crucial to getting the communication cost to be very low uh, for the CK proofs and also for the other components. So one is that we use a heavily batched version of Kamenna Shoop encryption. Uh, so Kamenna Shoop encryption is a, a big chunk of the communication cost of the protocol. And it actually, it's a 4x communication overhead between the plain text and the ciphertext. And so the batching that we do here is a combination of the batching techniques from uh, Elgamal encryption and Paye encryption. So Kamenna Shoop can kind of be thought of as a hybrid between Elgamal and Paye. And so one of the optimizations is to reuse the first component across multiple ciphertexts, like a common uh, optimization for alpha mod encryption. A second one is to use a uh, Damgard Zurich style optimization as it's available in Paye encryption, which is to do everything mod n to bs plus one instead of just n square. And the uh, tricky part here is that we have to, this ends up blowing up the plain text space. And so we have to modify the protocol to batch multiple OPR evaluations into a single Kubernetes shoot ciphertext and to show how to do this. And this has a big impact on the communication overhead factor uh, for a shoot. And the second big kind of batching that we do is batching the Sigma protocol. So uh, there's uh, two uh, points to note here. So uh, one is that uh, since we have to, all our proofs need a range component, uh, we actually modify the standard way of batching uh, Sigma protocols so that uh, we more carefully control the slack induced by uh, the batching. Uh, 
the the slack in the range was uh, uh, induced by the patching, and this has a big impact on our communication overheads. And the second is we give a new batch proof for commander troop decryption and technically for the decrypt inward exponentiated proof. And overall, this makes it so that our proofs are asymptotically sublinear in the input sizes, and the proofs actually become a very small part of the overall communication cost in our concrete measurements. And so finally, I'd like to talk about some of our uh, measurements for our protocols and comparisons with other worlds. So uh, our first comparison is going to be against the semi-honest DDH protocol when we try to aggressively minimize the communication costs. And it turns out if we use the very aggressive choice of uh, batching parameters, then we can greatly reduce the communication costs uh, to something very competitive, which is between 4 and 5x expansion over the semi-honest DDH-based protocol. Uh, but it turns out that this has a large impact on the computation costs. So if we try to instead uh, minimize monetary costs, we end up with parameters that give like less of a, a communication, uh, give more communication costs, but uh, much lower computation. And so here we have like a 7x increase in communication. And overall, we have like a 24 to 25 increase in uh, monetary costs that, uh, executing the protocol. And this monetary cost uses these uh, costs for resources from uh, Google Cloud Platform, but for AWS and Azure, it's pretty similar uh, cost. And in terms of comparing to other protocols that uh, try to do malicious PSI, uh, we note that uh, the sort compare shuffle is the most prominent one that gives two-sided output with computing over the intersection. And in this case, we have a uh, monetary cost, which is like 10 to 50 times better. And uh, communication cost that's a lot, lot better than this work. And uh, actually, you can see that even relative to the very efficient one-sided PSI uh, protocols, the malicious secure PSI protocols, we only have a moderate uh, monetary cost increase, uh, even though we give two-sided output and compute over the intersection. Uh, we note that this comparison doesn't include a very recent work from Eurocurve 2020, which actually has a much better uh, monetary cost than the previous works. Uh, but we note that this uh, new work also only has one-sided PSI, and so some significant extra cost is needed in order to make it two-sided PSI and to support computing over the intersection. Okay, and with that, I'd like to conclude, and thank you for your time.